Thank you for joining iMeet. Elise, would you give us one moment, and uh, I'll pull your slides this up. This meeting is now being recorded. Okay, Dr. Lee, you should have the floor. Let us know if we can assist you with the slide advancement. Great. Good morning or afternoon or evening, everyone. Um, it's my pleasure and honor today to uh, talk about uh, management of peru infection, which is a, a rapidly advancing field in the last few years. Um, first of all, I'd like to acknowledge um, you may or may not realize the amount of work that David and Russell actually put behind the scenes to make these things happen, um, especially for someone who hasn't done a lot of webinar like myself, so they have given me a lot of help. So thank you very much. Um, most of the things that I will cover today are covered in these two review articles from my group. Uh, the top one is on uh, the practice of TPA and DNAs, and the bottom one is about some of the active research that is happening and where we see the field going uh, in the next few years. Before I start, I would like to uh, define what we're talking about when we say pro infection. When patients with pneumonia comes in, they often do not have a pro effusion right from the start. If you use very sensitive modality like ultrasound, you'll find that there will be about 40 to 50% of them that will have a pro effusion. And they are at the start usually a simple effusion which is uh, free-flowing and has a pH that is neutral. About 10% of these simple paranemonic effusion will get secondarily infected and they are called complicated paranemonic effusion. They're exceeding in pH and often there's a lot of fibrin and septation. And at the extreme end of those are the empyema which is frank pus. If you look at the literature in the last few years then the term Puro infection is used in all the large clinical trials. And what it did is that it drew a line at this point and encompasses all the puro effusions that are complex pneumonic effusions and empyemas. So puro infections means pus, uh, puro fluid that are culture or gram stain positive for an organisms and all the complicated pneumonic effusions. Hippocrates is always my hero when it comes to puro disease. And back in about 400 years before Christ, he was publishing a lot uh, on pleural infection. He uh, didn't have ultrasound. He didn't have x-ray. He doesn't even have a stethoscope. So he used to shake the patient by the shoulders to identify the sound of fluid in the pleural space. Uh, I've tried it a couple of times. I'm not as good as he is, and I couldn't make it work. So I wouldn't recommend it. He also described the sign of damp earth, which is to cover the forex of the empyema patient in mud to identify the rib space that dries first as the hotter spot. Uh, for now, it's now 25 centuries since Hippocrates' days. We have modern day antibiotics, we have intensive care, uh, but despite all these medical advances, we have failed to eradicate empyema. Throughout the last 25 centuries, a lot of very famous people have succumbed to pleural infection. Next time you look at the $100 bill, then Benjamin Franklin had pneumonia and empyema and died from it. So did Karl Marx, and other very famous people have written in their books that they have got um, uh, childhood recurrent pleurisy. And unfortunately, pleural infections are still rising in incidence around the world. Uh, this is the national data from the USI from 1996 to 2008. This is the hospital admissions uh, per 100,000 people right from 1996 to 2008 uh, divided into age groups. And you can see amongst any age group there has been a trend of increasing incidence of hospitalization for pleural infection, but the trend is strongest at those 40 to 64, and much more so in those over 65. And that has also been shown in a lot of other countries. This is a review article that uh, Grant Waterer and I uh, published back in 2011 now. And all the asterisks indicate places that has published national or uh, regional data that suggest that their pro infection rates are still going up. But there has been a lot more research and advances in pleural infection in the last 10 years than any other time since uh, the days of Hippocrates. And 
I'm going to start with a case, and uh, recently I did see a lot of cases of peru infection, and this is just one I pulled up. Uh, this is a 38-year-old professional man who is otherwise very healthy. He looks after himself. He has an upper respiratory tract infection about a month or so ago. But over the week before presentation, he has worsening cough, fever, and a bit of chest pain. And this is his chest X-ray presented uh, last month in February 12. Um, and I hope you can see that. He presented to the emergency department. It was febrile. His chest X-ray was performed. The CURP 65 score is zero, so he's not that unwell at that time, but you can see that he's got uh, abnormal parenchyma on the chest X-ray. He was diagnosed to have pneumonia, sent him on oral antibiotics. But he didn't get any better. In fact, he got a lot worse over the next 48 hours. He presented again to the emergency department. He was febrile. His C-reactive protein was more than 450. Uh, normal is less than 10 in our laboratory. He was hemodynamically stable, so by CURP 65 the definition, he still scores zero. And another chest X-ray was performed. This was the first presentation two days ago, and this is the presentation now. And you can see that there are now uh, collections around the, the, the apical areas in the prosopheneum. And uh, if you look very carefully, there's also a collection in the paracardic uh, region. So at this point, what would you do now? Um, you can have a quick chat. And uh, A is, is because his CURP 65 score is zero, so by a lot of the uh, guidelines, you might still not want to admit him. You might just change to use more broad-spectrum antibiotics and uh, send him home again. You might admit him for intravenous antibiotics, um, do an ultrasound, maybe a CT scan, or you think that that's got enough to send him to cardiothoracic surgery. So I might just ask you to see what you would do and uh, might ask David or, or Russ to count the, the response. So for members of the audience, you can use the chat box at the bottom left hand to answer uh, Dr. Lee's questions. So I'm seeing a lot of responses, and they're all saying B, and that's uh, exactly what we did. Um, so we admit him because this is the second presentation. He's quite sick, uh, so I think that's not fair to send him home again. So the, throughout the talk, I'm going to highlight a few points that I thought I have learned uh, over the years that are important. Uh, the first is that pleural effusion is a very significant prognostic factor in pneumonia. This is something that I've learned in the last 18 months or so. This is a project that was done by Nathan Dean. Uh, my name was on the paper, but I'm mainly there for moral support. Nathan did all the work. Um, Nathan is based in um, the state of Utah, and they've got very, very good uh, electronic databases. So he was able to access um, all the emergency department presentation over a 24-month period, and that amounts to about 450,000 people, um, and sorting by the pneumonia and empyema code, it narrows down to 7,700, and excluding those who didn't have radiographic evidence to confirm pneumonia, those who have previous pneumonia, etc. Then the first presentation of community-acquired pneumonia, it was narrowed down to about 4,700 cases. And 85% of them did not have a pleural effusion on their imaging in ED, be it um, chest X-ray or CT scan, but 15% did. And if he compares the 15% that have a pleural effusion right from the beginning of the uh, pneumonia presentation, they were older, they have higher brain natriuretic peptide levels, and they have higher comorbidity scores. But more importantly, if he compares the, 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 the group on the left-hand side, which is pneumonia without pleural effusion at the first presentation, and the groups of patients that has a pleural effusion at the first presentation, and those who did have a pleural effusion were significantly more likely to be admitted to hospital. And like our patient, if he wasn't admitted for the first time, they're much more likely to be admitted to hospital within the next seven days. And once they're in hospital, they stay at least twice as long. Um, I think you might be familiar with CURP 65, which is used very commonly uh, outside America and some American groups um, use the continuous use age as a continuous variable rather than a 65 above or below cutoff, and this is a very well validated predictor of survival in pneumonia cohorts. Uh, 
But when we applied this uh, E curve to the 4,700 patients, in those 4,000 patients who have pneumonia but no pleural at the start, then the predicted mortality by E curve was 4.7%. The actual mortality was 5%, which is very, very, very accurate. However, if you look at those 700 patients who have pneumonia and the pleural effusion, the predicted mortality was 7%, but the actual mortality was twice as high. So in other words, CURB-65 or e -curb grossly underestimated the mortality risk of those patients with pneumonia who presents with a pleural effusion. And the statisticians did a lot of adjustments, uh, but accounting for all the other uh, variables, the 30-day mortality is still at least twice as high in patients who present with a pleural effusion. So pleural effusion is a very poor indicator of prognosis in people with, uh, with pneumonia, especially if they are present at the start of presentation. Whether it is actually directly contributing to the poor outcome or whether it is just a marker of comorbidity, we don't really know at this point. So back to our patient. So this is what it looks like on the chest X-ray. Remember, it's got collections everywhere, uh, APCs uh, in the costal phrenic angle and just outside the heart border and it looks very loculated on the CT scan. And on the CT scan, if you look at the lung windows, then he's also got uh, parenchymal consolidation in almost every lobe. He's got widespread nodular changes. Uh, some of them might even have early cavitating changes. So the working diagnosis, given his uh, recent upper respiratory tract history, uh, is staphylococcus aureus pneumonia and empyema. So he was really unwell at the bedside. Um, he, he's hemodynamically stable. He was not particularly hypoxic, uh, but this is otherwise a well man and he's never been so sick before. Um, the patient and the family understandably were very anxious. So they asked the question, is this serious doctor? Is this life threatening? So how many of you would say that there, and there might be, there's no right or wrong answer, but um, I just want to just pull the audience and see what you think. And there might be more than one answer that you feel is correct. A, whether you think he's likely to make a full recovery with the right treatment, or whether you would tell him that this is a serious condition and up to 20% of adults will die, and, uh, or whether he should go uh, to cardiothoracic surgery uh, in order to have a chance of survival. So I'm seeing that a lot of you say A, and some say B, and some say A and B, and that's exactly what we did. Um, we think that he's likely to make a full recovery with the right treatment, and, but we did also tell him that statistically about 20% of adults who has pyema will die within the next three months. I think in the year 2017, I'm very glad that no one actually say that he needs urgent surgery uh, because increasingly our medical management is now getting very good and very few people need to go to surgery, at least in our unit. But we did need to recognize that Peru infection is still a very significant uh, disease and is associated with very high mortality. This is also from another group from Utah, and they have got very good database, and they can actually tell us on the y-axis, this is the mortality per 10,000 people uh, in the state of Utah from 1900, so 100, more than 100 years ago to the year 2000 to 2005. And you can see that the mortality from Peru infection was really high at the time of the Spanish flu. And uh, it, gets, it subsided very dramatically when penicillin was introduced and antibiotics had to keep uh, the mortality very much at base until in uh, recent years that there is a resurgence of the mortality. And that has been seen not just in the state of Utah but around the world. So how can we reassure this man that he's going to uh, do well and he can survive. Um, in the last few years, that is uh, the development of this so-called RedPit score, which is uh, by Nat Raman and Nick Maskell, which is a validated prognostic guide developed uh, from the MIST-1, which is multi-center intrapural sepsis trial 1 uh, cohort, 454 patients, and then applied and validated in the MIST-2 cohort. And the RedPit stands for uh, renal impairment, if the patient has got renal impairment, it's uh, got poorer prognosis. Um, age is an important factor. If you have uh, empyema over the age of 50, you're more likely to die. 
And I strongly recommend that if you ever want to have uh, empyema, you must do it before the age of 70 because the risk goes up very dramatically for patients over the age of 70. Interestingly, patients who have frank pus is, actually has a better outcome than those who, who have a complicated paranemonic effusion. Uh, not surprisingly, inpatient acquired or hospital acquired empyema did worse, and those who have low albumin level did worse. But what does RAPID actually teach us? Um, we often call RAPID score the crumbling score, which means that if your patient is old, if they're in hospital for another reason already, if they got multi organ failure, and if they got poor nutritional status indicating maybe chronic illnesses, then they're likely to do poorly. So pleural infection often is a marker of frailty. And you notice that in the rapid score, there's nothing about how many loculations they have, what organisms they have. It is all their comorbidities. So the patient often die from the comorbidity rather than from the sepsis. And because of that reason, um, it is another piece of evidence that surgery is not likely to reduce mortality in these group of patients. So if you apply the rapid score to our patient, uh, you can give him some scientific proof that he is likely to live and make a full recovery. But it has always been a controversy whether management of pleural infection should be to use surgical drainage as soon as possible, and this is still happening in many centers in the world, or as the absolute last resort in other centers. So what we have learned um, in recent years from the large multi-center trials is that the majority of pleural infection be cured with antibiotics and chest tube drainage without requiring surgery. So very often in large clinical trials, um, if you look at if the academics would tell you that a lot of information can be gained from looking at the control group. So the multicenter interpural sepsis trial one and trial two were two large randomized trials published in the New England Journal. And if you look at the control group of both uh, trials, which is the group that was just treated with antibiotics and chest tube drainage, you can see that the 73 to 84% of these people were successfully treated without requiring any additional therapy or surgery. And I'm just going to divert to another case and just show you an example. Uh, this man came into our care. He's a 52-year-old who has a very high BMI, presented to emergency with four-week history of cough, fever, and chest pain. He was very septic, hypotensive, hypoxic. He was intubated at the emergency department. Uh, he required fluid resuscitation and some ionotropes, and his chest x-ray shows a very large right-sided pleural effusion. And uh, because on the ultrasound there was suspicion whether it, some of that was lung abscesses, so we did an urgent CT scan right away to see how much is pleural based and how the lung parenchyma, and it indeed confirmed that the CT scan shows a large multiloculated empyema, but also has got lung abscesses. But the majority were pleural fluid. So the question is whether you would send this person to surgery immediately because he was so sick or not. Well, we didn't. Uh, we uh, started broad spectrum antibiotics right away in the emergency department. A chest tube was placed immediately on the CT scanner table. Uh, once we confirmed that the majority was actually in the pleural base, not uh, lung abscesses, uh, and we drained a lot of frank pus right on the CT table, and the culture grew uh, Streptococcus intermedius, which is one of the most common organisms in the UK or Australasian uh, series. And he made a very rapid improvement. Most of the empyema was drained open, o uh, overnight, and uh, he was extubated off the inotropes uh, very rapidly. Uh, and you wouldn't imagine that looking at the amount of friend pus and also the apparent amount of loculation that it would drain so easily. This is one month at follow-up and three months at follow-up. So he never required surgery. He made a very uneventful recovery. So it's quite important to, to realize that although modern-day imaging like CT scan and ultrasound can show you a lot of loculation and septations, do remember that they are not exactly three-dimensional pictures that you are seeing, and it doesn't actually tell you that the empyema is necessarily 360 degrees uh, ward off. The only way to know whether the, the fluid can be drained adequately by chest tube is to drain it and see. And the role of surgery in pleural infection has always been debated. Um, if you actually look at the literature, there's actually very little evidence um, these are the only two uh, clinical trials that has compared surgery to chest tube drainage plus or minus fibrinolytics alone. Uh, 
The most famous series is this one, and it, it, it does tell you that if you have a very good idea, you don't actually need to do a lot of work. This is 19 patients only in the study, 10 in each arm, and this study has been cited hundreds of times because this is the only uh, randomized controlled trials uh, comparing surgery in empyema. In both studies, there was no differences in the mortality, so surgery did not actually do too much better or worse, no different in cost. But in both studies, there was a slight shortening of the number of days in hospital by surgery. The principles of management of peru infection have not changed for the last uh, many hundreds of years. It's to control the infection and sepsis with antibiotics and try to remove as much as possible the peru infective collections. This involved draining of the pus through chest tubes, and a lot of times you have to break down the adhesions to facilitate that, and surgery or fibrinolytics are the uh, options you have got. But what do, you, what do you do in those 20 or 30% of the patients in the large clinical trials um, whose infection persists despite optimal antibiotics and chest tube drainage? So back to the first case that we said with uh, the patient who's got Staphylococcus aureus and pyema, he shows some initial improvement with the chest tube drainage. Uh, this is the admission chest tube, and remember the three large loculations. And after two days, his fever settled, his C-reactive protein halved, uh, and his fluid indeed got Staph aureus as we predicted. But then his improvement plateaued. Uh, his CRP is stuck around 200, uh, normal is less than 10 in our laboratory, and he still have residual loculations around the heart and also uh, in the costophrenic angle. So what would you do next? Would you do, um, and I might just ask to see how many people would do surgery, how many would give them uh, fibrinolytics like urokinase or TPA, how many of you would give uh, combined urokinase uh, or streptokinase with DNAs nowadays, or try to persevere with antibiotics and chest tube drainage. So it sounds like everybody would favor the use of TPA and DNA, so that's good. Uh, I think every time I've been doing this talk in the last two or three years, there's an increasing number of people that is going to use TPA and DNAs, uh, which is a very, very uh, good thing to see. So um, I'll just go back a little bit to the history. So. Uh, fibrinolytics are still being used in a lot of countries because of the uh, lack of availability of DNAs. But these two trials by Nick Masco in New England Journal and Andreas Diakon in the Blue Journal have both shown that streptokinase has no benefit over placebo by itself. And that has also been shown in the MIST-2 study that TPA by itself was no better than placebos. And we believe that the two major obstacles to effective drainage is the fibrinous loculations and also the viscosity of pus. So that's the basis of TPA and DNAs, and we believe that they have synergistic effect to improve proof fluid drainage. So the MIST-2 study, which is the four-arm study with DNA plus placebo, TPA plus placebo, DNA plus TPA, or placebo plus placebo, uh, published in the New England Journal, did show that there was significantly more improvement with TPA and DNAs. So this is the radiographic improvement at day seven compared with day zero in the chest X-ray. Um, this is the percentage of the hemiphorax covered by the um, uh, pura opacity. And so zero means that at day seven, the X-ray was no different than day one. And negative 100% means that it has a complete clearance of the pleural opacity. So you can see in the placebo group, there's about a 30% improvement. But fibrinolytics by itself was no different than the placebo. DNA by itself was no different than the placebo. But it's only the combination treatment that doubles the clearance radiographically. And also, 15% uh, of the patients in the placebo group end up in surgery but TPA and DNA cures 96% of the patients without requiring surgery. And it has also shown a significant reduction in the um, uh, days they spent in hospital. So these patient, this patient has three days of TPA and DNA, and you can see that that's a very nice clearance uh, of the collections, uh, and he became afebrile, C-reactive protein settled, and it was discharged on that X-ray. He was back to work the next day and continued oral antibiotics for a further two weeks. This was the chart of his C-reactive protein. There was a time when he was admitted, um, and chest tube drainage and antibiotics makes a significant improvement, but then it becomes plateaued. 
and through three days of TPA and DNA, as you can see, a dramatic improvement. Another important point that I always want to highlight is that uh, we are not here to treat the chest, provided that the infection settles residual pleural opacity will resolve with time, and surgery is unnecessary to clear the pleural infections uh, or collections when the patient clinically improved. So Andreas Diakon uh, followed up his patients from South Africa, uh, and this is the percentage of the X-ray opacity that they have on admission. So very sick people, more than half of the uh, hemiphorax is covered with pleural opacity at the time of admission, halved by the time of discharge, and by three months and six months, it's down to about 5% uh, residual opacity, and the lung function improved correspondingly. So this patient, for example, uh, he, he's a dentist. He did not actually have uh, pleural infection. He just had a right upper lobe pneumonia. And the purpose of showing you this case is that I want to emphasize that pleural infection, we should view them like lung infection or pneumonia, and that residue changes will settle with time, provided infection is under control. So he came in septic, and we gave him two or three days of intravenous antibiotics, and by day three, the X-ray was absolutely no difference from the emission X-ray. But his C-reactive protein and fever all settled. Um, I mean, what would you do at that situation? Would you send him to the surgeons for lobectomy because his chest X-ray has not improved? And I'm sure you won't do that. Instead, you would reassure him that the X-ray changes will settle with time. And that's exactly what happens. This is what he comes back in a month's time. If you apply the same principle of managing people with residual shadowing on chest X-ray in pneumonia, to pleural infection, then I think the world will send a lot fewer patients to surgery. So this is another example. This is an 18-year-old girl who has a ruptured appendix, was very septic, and was in ICU for a while, and developed a pleural effusion, which is very loculated. You can see two chest tubes and still got these residue collections. By the time I was asked to see her, her fever and C-reactive protein was entirely settled to near normal with antibiotics, but she still has that nasty-looking chest X-ray. And again, if you ask yourself the same question, should we send her to surgery because the X-ray just looks like there's a very nasty collection, or should we just apply the same principle as we did for the last pneumonia case to just reassure her that the X-ray changes will settle with time because her sepsis is well controlled? And that's exactly what I did. Um, and I took out all the chest strains at the protest of the surgeons and sent her home on antibiotics. And this is one week later, three weeks later, and then the subsequent x-rays were normal. So remember to treat the patients, don't treat the x-rays. Uh, I remember Richard Light always teaches me that if the, if the radiologist or the surgeon is not happy with the, uh, with the residue collection on the x-ray, put another chest tube on the radiologist or the surgeons, but the, but the patient doesn't need it. Um, sounds like to me that you have all had experience using TP and DNAs. Uh, we do it very routinely uh, nowadays. The question remains is, does it work in real life, and what are the patients you use it on, and how safe it is? So do remember in the MIST-2 cohort that most of the patients chest, treated with chest tube and antibiotics uh, in the placebo group actually did well. So therefore, the question is, do we need to apply TP and DNAs to everybody who came through the door, or should we use them only as a rescue therapy when patients are not improving with the standard treatment? So this is a paper that we published a while back now. So it is the largest cohort of open-label use of TP and DNAs from uh, Australia, New Zealand, and the UK, and uh, 107 patients. And these are patients who are very sick. They've already had chest tube drainage and antibiotics, but they were not improving. Uh, most of them have other comorbidities. 20% has what we call severe medical issues, either cancer or end-stage renal failure on dialysis. Half of them have frank pus, and 87% uh, of them have loculated effusion on ultrasound. And despite that, TP and DNA was able to cure 93% of them without requiring surgery. And uh, they survived the infection, did not require surgery, has radiographic, clinical, and improvement in inflammatory markers, and were discharged home. And this is the uh, data that we get. This is the amount of pure fluid they, they drained. Uh, each circle represents one patient. And this is 24 hours before um, 
the, the TPN DNA, so a median drainage of 250 cc's. Within 24 hours, 1.3 liters, and three days worth of TPN DNA, the cumulative total is 2.5 liters drained. If you look at the percentage of the hemiforex on the X-ray that is covered by pure opacity, it dramatically reduced by uh, from 35% to 14% with TPN DNAs. If you look at this C-reactive protein as a baseline on day one, then it progressively dropped over the next few days. So TPN DNAs works well, but the question, of course, is what is the safety profile? Do remember that the MIS-2 study was a four-arm study, so although it has 200 patients, only 48 patients were actually treated in the TPA DNA's arm. So it's still a relatively new treatment. One of the concerns that many people have is that the next day after you give TPN DNA's, you always have a, a bucket of very red-looking fluid. And it can be quite alarming when you first started doing this because of the large volume of hemorrhagic fluid drained. Um, but don't panic, this is absolutely uh, normal. Uh, the, the fluid induced by TPA can be quite hemorrhagic. Uh, the hematocrit is often uh, about a third or a quarter of blood. Um, so if you drain a very large volume, you sometimes will see a slow drop in the hematocrit or hemoglobin uh, over the next few days and occasionally require blood transfusion. But as soon as you stop using the TPA, that should not happen again. Uh, and in my experience, it never causes um, massive arterial bleed like GI bleed and causes hemodynamic collapse. A patient's always very stable and you transfuse them only because that there's a slow decrease in the hemoglobin levels. So the short-term safety for um, TPN DNA use uh, is good, but you do remember that the published data is limited at the moment to about 340 patients. So these are the series that has been published using TPN DNAs. This is the original New England Journal paper of 48 patients. Uh, this paper is the largest cohort from our group, and this is one of our recent publications that is in press now. And you can see that in all these series, there's never been any fatal bleeding. When I say puro bleed, I mean that uh, the patients that require blood transfusion, and that's 3%. Um, only the New England Journal paper actually re reported systemic bleedings, but uh, do remember in that study even the placebo group has also got systemic bleeding. These are, these are probably events that are not directly related to the TPN DNAs. So if you look at this chart, it is quite reassuring. And we are, we are now very um, confident in using TPN DNAs, partly because we believe that whatever the risk the patient has in using TPN DNAs, especially bleeding risks, that the same bleeding risk will exist if you send the patient to surgery, and if not, worse. So this, for example, is a patient that we treated who's got underlying one really Brand's disease, chronic thrombocytopenia, and has also got a BMI over 40. And it comes in with a whole chest full, full of pus. A large bore chest tube was put in, and it didn't actually make a lot of difference, uh, but three days of TPN DNAs did make the, a significant improvement. And I borrowed this slide from Dr. Alex West, and uh, he and his colleague, uh, Dr. Ahmed, has actually used TPN DNAs in a couple of patients in the intensive care who was on ECMO to sustain life. This young man has necrotizing pneumonia and empyema. The surgeons deemed that he is too unstable to, to have an operation. So three days worth of TPN DNAs, you can see significant improvement, extubated the next day. Um, I do need to mention, however, the short term is pain, and it is very important to actually mention to your patients that uh, they might feel pain, especially in the first dose. It's quite interesting that it doesn't usually happen in subsequent doses, but about 20% in uh, all the series that has been published did report significant pain with the first dose uh, of the patient. So I usually warn the patients so there's no unnecessary surprise. The mechanism is unclear. It may be related to breaking the adhesions, and I often uh, give extra analgesics before I give the first dose. A lot of questions about whether we can use other fibrinolytics. Um, TPA was used in the original New England Journal study because it's widely available. It's a little bit more expensive in Australia, but uh, if you compare with the amount of TPA used, uh, compared with your cardiology and neurology colleagues, then it is only a drop in the ocean uh, for your hospital overall expenses. Um, other fibrinolytics probably work, but we haven't proven that. 
Dr. Idel is uh, developing a new fibrinolytic that's specifically used for plural purposes and shown in the animal studies that is uh, useful. It's called single-chain urokinase plasminogen activator, and it's got an NIH grant to proceed it to a phase one study. At the moment, what we do is to stick with the New England Journal regime, which is to give the TPA um, and then clamp the tube for 45 minutes, open the tube for 45 minutes, then give the DNAs, clamp the tube for 45 minutes, and then open it again and do it twice daily. And we see the patient every day with chest X-ray, uh, blood inflammatory markers. We don't always give the full three days' worth of six doses. We can stop it as soon as the patient uh, is, is cleared of the fluid or if they are very, very uh, improved. Um, it's very rare that you need more than three days' worth. Uh, that regime was very cumbersome, and uh, I remember doing a grand round somewhere in America, and one of the residents asked me why it has to be a 12-hourly doses, because apparently the nurses uh, in his unit refused to give it, and he has to come back in the night time to give the 12-hourly doses. And, and I emphasized that I don't think we ever said that this 12-hourly doses is twice daily. And I think he, at one stage, was so glad that he wants to jump up to the stage and give me a kiss so that he doesn't have to go into the hospital in the middle of the night. Um, we don't actually know how variation in the delivery uh, regime may or may not impact on the efficacy of the drug. Um, we should also emphasize that the dose used um, in the MIS-2 regime of 10 mg of TPA was entirely empiric. Um, there was never a phase one dose finding study that has been done. Because most of the patients get cured, we ask the question whether we can reduce the dose of TPA used. Um, so we are doing uh, studies of what we call dose de-escalation studies uh, with different centers around the world. Um, since 10 milligram works, so we thought we'll try it and start with 5 milligram. And this paper is now uh, in press in the White Journal, uh, where we show in 60 or 70 patients that starting with 5 milligram and only go up to 10 milligram if you think that the patient is not improving appropriately seems to work quite well and we are in the process of uh, testing 2.5, and we'll keep going down until we find the lowest as, uh, effective dose. Um, because of how effective TPA and DNA is, um, there's really no um, major advantage that we still need very big size chest strains. Remember the, the old teaching that you need a big bore tube because uh, plural infection fluid is difficult to drain. It's not really true. It's not because of the thickness of the fluid, but because of the loculation. So it doesn't matter how big the chest tube you put in, the fluid can be drained because of the loculation, uh, and it's not going to help. The next question is whether TPN DNA should be started right at the beginning when the patients come in. Uh, that was the case in the New England Journal. And you can also use the counter argument of what we did as uh, rescue therapy if the patient did not improve in the day one or day two. I don't think there's any right or wrong, but I do want to point out that in the New England Journal, there was a shortening of the length of stay. So the advantage is not just to avoid surgery, but reducing the length of stay. So that is something to consider as well. Um, a, a lot of uh, people, especially in North American centers, uh, ask whether you can simplify the installation. Um, I think theoretically there's no reasons why you can't. Uh, we tend not to because we, we, we don't think that there's enough evidence to, to do that. But in the papers that I quoted before, there has been variations in, uh, in some centers using mixing the drugs together for installation or install one right away after the other. Uh, that has all been used before. And some centers have gone to using daily ones instead of twice daily regimes. So you continue to see a lot more of these variations uh, that people like to try, and that's quite going to be quite interesting. But I want to emphasize that although the original regime said you have to use three days and six doses, you don't have to use all three days and six doses. A lot of the patients we improve. In our hands, probably at least one-third or half of them will not require all three days' worth, and you can uh, shorten the length of stay if you see them every day. Um, I also want to emphasize, although TP and DNAs work very, very well, it is one of the drugs that comes very unusual because it comes through an investigator-led pathway rather than a pharmaceutical company-driven pathway. If it is a drug that is uh, driven by the pharma 
pharmaceutical companies, there will be a lot of rules to ensure that they follow up all the patients to make sure there's no long-term side effects. But because TPN DNA was done by investigators themselves, there is no such rules. So we think that we have some moral responsibility that we should follow up these patients. Um, it is a duty of us to confirm uh, that these patients that we treated with TPN DNAs were okay in the long term. So we do bring them back uh, uh, a few months later uh, in order to test that their, their lung function and x-rays and uh, they don't have developed new diseases, etc. So if you are interested in joining us, uh, Natalia Forrest is our research fellow who is looking uh, into this and she's got a, a large collection of patients. And if you want to contribute data to that, um, we'll be very, very happy for, us, for you to join us. Um, so in summary, how should we manage patients with peru infection in the year 2017? Uh, antibiotics and chest tube drainage is still very important, like in this patient with multi-loculated peru infections. Uh, sometimes if you find that you put in one chest tube and it hasn't worked, you might need um, another one uh, imaging guided uh, in order to target the other locutes. If the infection uh, symptoms and signs, which is the fever and the inflammatory markers, did not settle despite optimal antibiotics and optimal drainage, then TPN DNAs would be very useful. So after three days' worth of TPN DNA is very good clearance, and this is at one month post-discharge. Um, surgery in our hands is now very rarely needed to the extent that our surgeons uh, fight over the cases because they get so few referrals from me nowadays. Um, it is only indicated if there is contraindication to TPN DNAs. The most common we would find is are the patients who had a bronchoporeal fistula. If you give TPN DNAs intrapurally in those patients, they will immediately cough it up within the next few minutes, and you know that you'll never give them another dose. And there's a very small number of patients who would have failed um, uh, to respond to TPN DNAs. And in our hands, in the last 100 or so patients, we, we were able to reproduce the MIS-2 study and have a less than a 5% uh, rate of sending patients to surgery. This is Anna Pavlova, who was a very famous dancer. Um, and at that and her time, she developed an Empire email while she was on tour in Dang Haig. She was told by someone that if she had surgery and open drainage, she would never be able to dance again. So she declined surgery and unfortunately died from the disease. So nowadays, if she comes to most of our units, then she would have TP and DNAs through a small tube, and she would have 96% chance of cure and would not have to have surgery and still be able to dance. So just to uh, conclude, and I would like to thank all my research group and my clinical and laboratory teams uh, for contributing all these data that you have just seen. And thank you very much. Thank you very Sorry, much, to... Dr. Lee. Um, if anybody has any questions, please enter them in the chat box at the, at the bottom. Um, while we're waiting for the first one, I actually am going to jump in and ask a question. So obviously it's rare, but occasionally we'll come across a patient who doesn't um, who doesn't respond to the Dornace TPA and is not a good surgical candidate. Um, what are your thoughts about one extended fibrolytic uh, treatment and two? early irrigation with antibiotics or COVID on iodine? Yeah, so uh, that's a very good question, and it's, it's, it's quite uncommon nowadays, but as we said, um, there's about 5% um, uh, of people who may fail to respond. Uh, the first instance is try to see if we can remove some of the other locules. So although TPN DNA is very powerful in trying to break down the loculations, but sometimes if they're very, very far away and the lung is very stuck down in between, you can't reach the, the, the far away pockets of collections. And if they continue to be septic, then usually it is because, uh, providing that there's no other source of infection outside the pleural space, then that's usually a result of uh, undrained loculations and try to see if you can use radio logically guided um, tube placement to, to try to target the 
remote collections would be the next uh, thing we do. And not uncommonly, we then put TPA and DNA through the second tube into the septic as well. Um, uh, you raise a very good point about irrigation. So the, some of the continental European centers uh, has always been using saline irrigation. Uh, and if you want to use it, this is to, um, to use a bag of 500 mils or one liter of saline. Uh, you, you need to make sure that you don't, it doesn't come out from the refrigerator directly. You have to warm it up, ideally to body temperature, if not at least at room temperature. You basically hook it up uh, on a intravenous giving set uh, on a pole, and then it connect to the chest tube and let the fluid, uh, let the saline run into the pool space. Um, and you mustn't push it, so it's not uh, pushing it in with a syringe, because if, if that's the case, there's a risk of uh, pushing the pus out into the subcutaneous tissues and causing infection. So you just let the fluid go in, and then once the fluid goes in to as much as it can, you flop the back down to the floor and let the fluid come out by gravity. So a little bit like peritoneal dialysis. Now, in theory, it, 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 it sounds quite good, but in practice, if you have a very loculated pool space, the, the, the saline doesn't run in very much by itself. It does work, however, quite well in people with uh, a trapped lung and uh, empty space that gets infected frequently. And we have had anecdotal successes in some of those cases. Um, it has been tested in a, in a small randomized trial by the Bristol group and shows that it is better than placebo. Although uh, it's very hard to know if the saline is a treatment group, what is the, what is the best placebo to use? <laughs> uh, it, it also um, raised the question as to whether, because the TPA was so powerful in generating fluid, whether some of the advantages that we see with TPA is actually a rinsing out effect of the pleural space, and I think that that is quite likely the case. Um, Intrapleural antibiotics is a very very interesting topic, and if you actually do a literature search, and our fellow Natalia has done that, um, that the largest um, pharmacokinetic studies of any drugs, antibiotics or chemotherapy agent in the pleural space does not have more than 30 patients. We really don't know what happens to the antibiotics, and that raises a more important questions. Where do the germs actually sit in the pleural space? I think it will work if the germ sits in the pleural fluid and very superficially, but in all the animal studies, um, and also if you look at patients with TB, you know that the culture of the tissue gives you a lot more yield than the culture of the fluid. So I think a lot of the bacteria actually sits inside the pleural tissues, and we do know that drugs given intrapurally only had a very uh, shallow penetration to the pleural tissues. So I think intrapleural antibiotics is a very interesting thing to try, but I think if it's to be tried, it should be tried together with intravenous antibiotics. Yeah. So uh, George Chen has uh, two questions. I'll put them together. First is, um, what's the halfway of TPA and Dornate? Why 45 minutes, why not two hours? And he followed it up by also asking um, if uh, you follow changes on chest for x-ray only or use Alpha 7 CT. Sure. Um, the first question first, I have absolutely no idea what's the half-life of TPA in the plural space. Uh, as I said, all the pharmacokinetic studies in the plural space is it's got very minimal number of patients. Um, we do know, however, that the TPA has very short half-life, like if you give it for myocardial infarction, there's very short half-life of minutes in the, in the systemic circulation. So we would imagine that the pleural space uh, would have even shorter number of, of minutes. So I think it will, it will break away very quickly. Um, so therefore, the, uh, that's a very good question. Why do we need to clam for 45 minutes and why not faster? Uh, and certainly not two hours. I think the, the question would be whether we can claim for a shorter time. I think that's a very good question, and, and I think TPA and DNA is so, so new that we are still um, optimizing a lot of the regimes that we are looking at, especially like doses and things, and I think eventually we will look at some of these um, uh, delivery issues. Uh, Fergus Gleason has got a very beautiful uh, video uh, in the New England Journal uh, with Nick Maskell. Uh, if you're interested, you can look up the images of the month archives. 
and he injected under ultrasound guidance streptokinase into a very loculated fluid, and then he can actually um, uh, monitor it. And he, he, when he repeated the ultrasound, within 10 minutes, all the locules and all the uh, fibrinous adhesions were broken. So I think TPA works very, very quickly. Uh, and I think, if anything, that the clamping time can be shortened rather than lengthened. Yeah. Uh, the second so question was about uh, imaging. Yeah, absolutely. Imaging, we we need to do it every day to see if the patient actually still needs the drugs the next day. Uh, if the chest X-ray shows that it's entirely clear, that's fine. I use chest X-ray because um, uh, to start every day because uh, a lot of the loculations might be in the fissures, it might be in the mediastinal side, and the ultrasound may not be able to accurately describe those. Um, and, and also sometimes they are in very awkward places for ultrasound like behind the scapula and things and you might miss a lot of things so you need the chest x-ray uh, but ultrasound is absolutely uh, essential because a lot of times these people may have uh, consolidation in the lung or raised hemidiaphragm and you can't really tell and you might mistake all those changes as residue collection and keep giving them um, uh, TPN DNA is unnecessarily. So I think you need to ultrasound them every day. You need to x ray them every day. Um, CT scan only um, if they're not responding. Then I, I will look for remote locules to see if I can drain those. Yep. Um, obviously, this is the ABIT, so someone had to ask this question. Um, what's the, do you see a point for medical fluoroscopy uh, in Empaima? Um I was asked to go and give the talk in the most unpopular one in the postgraduate course in ATS this year when people pay $450 to go to the postgraduate course of Puro disease to learn Puro intervention. And I was given the topic by my friends, obviously not very good friends, <laughs> uh, to, to say what is the future of medical fluoroscopy. And, and uh, I, I think if and I was speaking against it, so therefore I was very, very unpopular and I was graded very, very poorly on the uh, post postgraduate course survey, uh, not surprisingly. So I, I think that if you put in a small chest tube and you give TP and DNAs and you have a 90-something percent success rate, it's very hard to justify uh, doing medical thoracoscopy or surgical thoracoscopy. Right. So... Um uh, another question about CT, which I think you sort of answered, and um, uh, now a question about data on DPA, T, uh, TPA and DNA potentially increasing the risk of BP fistula formation in cystic lung disease patients. Sorry, on the risk of... Uh, somebody, uh, I'm sorry, it was asked by uh, uh, Stavik, uh, I can't pronounce his last name, uh, is there any data about DPA, T, uh, TPA and DNA potentially increasing the risk of BP fistula formation in patients with cystic lung disease? Yeah, yeah, sure. I, I think that's a very good question, and I actually had the case has a couple of those cases, but because of time, I've taken it out. Um, we often see patients with lung abscess and uh, and bronchopleural fistula, and uh, sometimes you won't see it uh, because you, you think it is all walled off. Um, but once you actually clear with TPN DNAs, you see that they start bubbling a bit. Um, if you know that they actually got a bronchopleural fistula, if you put in a chest tube and they actually bubbles, I don't usually give them TPN DNAs. We, we have tried before, unknowingly usually, and you'll find that the patient actually coughs up the TPA and DNAs. Apparently, it doesn't taste very nice. Uh, it won't come to any harm. TPA has such a short half-life, and the doses we're using is very, very small. And, of course, DNAs has been used in the airways for, for many decades, so you can reassure the patients it won't actually come to any harm. But it's not a very pleasant thing, so we don't usually do it. But um, we will aggravate a bronchopleural fistula. I don't, I don't think we have seen any of those cases. We have uncovered bronchopleural fistula uh, on not, not infrequently. Uh, so the, the, there's no air leak when, because the... Uh, the pleural space is so septated that it basically contained the air leak. But once we clear the septations, then the air leak become more apparent. So I don't think you necessarily actually caused uh, or reopened the bronchopleural fistula, but what you did is that you opened up all the, the septations so now that um, the air can freely move out of the lung. And that we have seen before. 
Uh, if that's the case, then you stop giving the TPA and you, you just let them heal um, the way you would for for if they didn't have a loculated empyema. Philip Ong from uh, Houston said that asked, you said earlier you mentioned that pleural infections like pneumonia can often resolve by themselves. And what's your threshold to observe versus intervene with Dornase and TPA? So what's the threshold to intervene? Is that the question? Sorry, I can't hear the Correct. second part. Yeah, so um, I think that's a very, very good question. And, and because we are writing an editorial, my fellow and I was writing an editorial yesterday about uh, whether we need to drain. So although Hippocrates said that, you know, if the empyema doesn't rupture, you die, that's way before the days of uh, antibiotics. And now you know that with antibiotics, um, you know, a lot of times we don't drain abscesses. So empyema is a form of abscess, isn't it? So, but it's in the pleural space. So times patients uh, with lung abscess, liver abscess, you just give them prolonged antibiotics. And I think nowadays for people with spontaneous bacterial peritonitis, the guideline is not to drain it and just give them antibiotics. So we're increasingly questioning as to whether everybody needs to be drained. Um, and then, but if you got to the stage where you have to drain and they've got residue collection, um, what I would do if they got pneumonic effusion, you put in a chest tube, they drained, but they still have some residue collections, then I'll look at what the patient's um, three criteria. One is how the patient is, including the temperature and how, whether they feel better. Uh, one is the serological, which is the, the white cell count and the C-reactive protein. And number three is the radiological uh, thing. So if they are all getting better, then I don't think they need TPA and DNAs. But if they're not, and they're still spiking fever or the C-reactive protein doesn't budge, um, then I think uh, it would be very useful to have TPA and DNAs. And I think because we are so confident with it nowadays and we think that a shortened length of stay, we have a much lower threshold of giving it quite early. But I do agree, not everybody needs it. Um, and uh, you should examine the patients every day for clinical improvement. Great. I think we have time for one or two more questions. Uh, George Cheng asked, um, patients who are on anticoagulation, heparin drip, Favix, Sorelto, Coumadin, do you hold the anticoagulation prior to giving the Dornase CPA? Yeah, this is a dilemma, especially when nowadays all these patients um, are on uh, no, uh, new oral anticoagulants that take so many days to clear. But the, the, the easier way for me to get out of answering that question is that you, you would have done something before you put in the chest tube. So um, you would normally have withheld or reversed the anticoagulation uh, before you put in the chest tube. So once you put in the chest tube, that probably, and, and, and if you haven't caused any bleeding, then I think the TPA probably wouldn't aggravate too much more. We do tend to withhold um, the the anticoagulants for that period of time, if we can. I mean, there's very, actually very little situations where you can't withhold it for a day or two, uh, you know, for, for atrial fibrillation or very small pulmonary emboli or previous history of DVT. I think those kind of things, to be on the safe side, you can withhold that. Um, occasionally in people who have very uh, recent stenting or large pulmonary emboli, then it becomes difficult and there's no data and you need to discuss and weigh up the risks. We tend to slightly wait a little bit more about the, about the TPA before we start and we, we know that it is absolutely necessary, then we do it. Um, and what we can do is put the patients on low molecular weight heparin on twice daily and then we can just give the dose, just give the intrapural TPA just before the next um, dose of the low molecular weight heparin um, and um, and then the, we know that the TPA has a very short half-life, so we might be able to commence back the dose of the uh, low molecular weight happening in one or two hours' time. But I don't have any evidence to support that. That's how we do. Uh, it, it may be right, it may not be, but we don't actually have uh, any significant bleeding. And as you see in our data, that life-threatening bleeding is extremely rare with TPA and DNAs. Um, and that is one of the reasons why we are doing the dose de-escalation de study. We're trying to establish what is the lowest possible dose we can use. Yep. Great. 
So the recording is going to end in about 30 seconds, but um, I'm just going to see if we can quickly get in one last question from David Shaw um, asking about if you notice any increased bleeding risk in patients with infected malignant effusions or other hemorrhagic effusions at baseline. Um, not uh, not that we have seen, uh, but obviously, as I said, the, the published data is only 344 patients. So out of that, the malignant effusion ones is not and it's not that many. We do. We, we are a very active center of malignant pleural effusion, and we use indwelling pleural catheter a lot. So we've published that our infection rate is about uh, somewhere between five to ten percent. So we do see patients coming back with uh, indwelling pleural catheter for malignant pleural effusions that get infected with an empyema, and they are sometimes difficult to treat. But on the other hand, they are usually not as sick because I presume that they they have been draining their malignant pleural effusions, so therefore they actually doesn't accumulate as much bacterial load, um, and, and we, we can usually treat them with TPA and DNAs, and uh, we feel quite comfortable doing that. Great. Well, Dr. Shaw, on behalf of me and Dr. Um, I'm sorry, Dr. Lee, on behalf of me and Dr. Shaw, I want to thank you for a, a really a fantastic talk. Um, uh, we thoroughly enjoyed it, and we know we, you got up quite early in Australia to give it. So. Um, at this point, um, I think we're going to end the uh, webinar. And again, thank you so much. Thank you for having me.